Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Microfluidic-Based Cell Sorting to Better Sample Preparation for 10X Genomics Application. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Nano Select Biomedical and 10X Genomics. To learn more, visit them at nanoselect.com and 10xgenomics.com. So let's get started. I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of our presentation. Also, please notice you can share the webinar on your personal social media. Just click on that social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on that support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and offers continuing education credits tab. Um, I'm sorry, education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. I now present today's speakers, Jose Marachis and Dr. Brian Fritz. Jose Marachis is the president and co-founder of NanoSelect Biomedical, and Dr. Brian Fritz is the associate director of strategic market development and programs in the immunology segment marketing at 10X Genomics. For a complete biography of our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, gentlemen. Jose, Brian, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, everybody. My name is Jose Marachas. I'm very excited to be here and tell you about uh, sample prep upstream of 10x genomics uh, and really show you how happy cells means better science. Uh, so let me just go ahead and get going here. Uh, what we're really interested in, I'm sure why you guys are interested in being here, is to really uh, understand what each individual cells uh, want to tell us. Uh, and, and allow us to uncover those things, because we strongly believe that uh, each one of these single cells want to be heard and understood. Um, they have secrets that they want to tell us, and these secrets are very important to be able to understand from the individual single cell level instead of a from a population level. And we understand that these, by doing so, uh, it really allows us to go into various different applications, uh, whether it's single cell genomics, gene editing, uh, antibody therapeutics, cell therapy, and even into the plant world and even the microbe world. And luckily, uh, in the last few years, uh, we've been able to develop many different tools that allow us to really decode and hear out and listen to uh, what each one of these cells has to say. Uh, so for this particular presentation, we'll be focusing on 10x genomics workflow um, that, you know, it's a great tool that allows us to probe each cell uh, and look at various things, uh, emulsiomics of things uh, within each cell. And one of the things that is critical when doing these types of workflows or becomes quite critical is the material that you actually start with at the beginning. Uh, and that's the sample prep stage. And we will be discussing on, uh, telling you a little bit of some of the things that can help with uh, being able to isolate and prep your cell sample so that you have the best experience possible and the best results possible uh, when you're processing cells uh, for a workflow like 10X Genomics, which can also be applied for any other a type of assay, single cell assay that you come across. 
And to be able to prep your sample properly, what's critical is that you're able to isolate your target cell population so that you're uh, actually doing the science and the, and the work on those cells that you're, you care about. And in order to have really good results, you also want to make sure you remove any background um, material like uh, debris or any dead cells or any doublets so that you can really be focusing on what you truly are trying to understand um, and remove biases in your science. And there are a number of things that you need to really consider and think about. Um, and you sometimes need to kind of take a step back when you're designing your various experiments um, and, and think through of, you know, how you're handling and working with uh, your sample. Uh, and here are just uh, some very general tips that sometimes get overlooked, but uh, it's very important that uh, you generally use wide bore pipette tips when working with cells. Again, you want to be very gentle, as gentle as possible. Um, avoiding excessive vortexing, uh, gentle centrifugation speeds, and obviously making sure that the buffers that you're working with are optimized, also maybe the temperatures as well. So those are very, uh, you know, key things, very simple things that you should always just be considering and, and be ready for uh, to, to have better, better results. Once you address those things, the next step is to enrich for your target cells uh, while at the same time removing that de debris, any dead cells, or any aggregates. And again, all that together is very important so that um, you can get uh, very good results uh, with your assay. Um, and if you don't do these things, it, it leads to various issues like a clog in the gem system, degraded RNA, uh, and then in the end, obviously, you're just uh, uh, reducing the accuracy of your sequencing results. And well, you know, everybody does, you know, is okay to agree that we don't want to be spending um, resources on on um, non-optimal data or experiments. So I'm going to give a high-level uh, overview of some of these techniques that you can use uh, to isolate and prepare your sample. Uh, the two most common applications or, or technologies used is magnetic bead cell sorting, which you guys are probably very familiar with, and then there's flow cytometry, or more specifically, fluorescent activated cell sorting. Uh, and these are two very common techniques, uh, and they have their advantages and disadvantages. Magnetic bead enrichment is quite simple, um, although it's, uh, you know, it has quite a bit of limitations of what it can do. Uh, High-speed uh, fluorescent-activated cell sorters. Obviously, you can isolate and direct uh, cells into collection channels uh, using many different parameters at high speed, uh, and those are great, but can sometimes be very complicated to use or an encumbrance for your for your assay because you may have to go use a core facility or may not have access to that technology. So what I'll be talking about is being able to use a technology that we developed called the Wolf cell sorter, which is um, an easy to use cell sorter. So it kind of takes the advantages of having an easy to use enrichment system like magnetic beads, but it also it comes along with the uh, multi-parameter method of being able to isolate your cells um, uh, and have those ready for downstream analysis. And very briefly, uh, the Wolf cell sorter just give you some highlights of this. This is something that you guys, we can, uh, forward you more information and follow up on. But uh, the advantages of the Wolf cell sorter are um, one, that they, when you sort the cells, it provides um, samples with high viability. You're able to sort away your dead cells, but it's also not damaging the cells because we use very low pressure. It's a very small footprint. Uh, you know, it's the size of a, almost like a, a home microwave. You can imagine that. Um, and then, we use a microfluidic technology, which I'll talk about in a second, that allows for the whole process to be uh, done in a, in a sterile and disposable system so that anything that the sample touches is part of the, this uh, disposable um, uh, uh, cartridge. So you don't have to worry about cross-contamination. And most importantly, what we really pride ourselves with is that we develop something that's very simple and intuitive. So you don't have to have years of flow cytometry experience to be able to use this technology to very quickly and efficiently isolate your cells and, and prep the sample uh, before you begin your experiments. And this is a, a 
provided at a fraction of the price compared to traditional sales sorters. So what's behind this? Oh, sorry. And this is uh, technology that's uh, compatible with uh, uh, 10x genomics. So our advantage here is that we use a microfluidic disposable cartridge and the sample is routed through these, these uh, channels and they get sorted just like a traditional sorter. We use uh, microfluidic, um, sorry, we use lasers and optics to identify uh, the right cell, you gate it, and then you can then sort that out. The difference is that we use this very gentle piezo actuator to gently divert the cells to the right channel and that's how we sort the cells. Uh, and by doing this process, our, our cells are going through a very low pressure environment uh, under two PSI. And if you compare this to traditional cell sorters, which can go up to 55 or 70 PSI. So we believe because of this difference, uh, we have a higher viability, especially with very sensitive cells. And we'll show a few examples of that um, in a little bit. So I'm just going to illustrate here the importance of, of doing uh, cell sorting upstream of 10x genomics uh, here just in an illustration. Uh, you know, if you start with the population, a mixed population of cells that may have, you know, you're, uh, you're wrong, uh, calling them wrong, but it's your non-targeted cells or damaged cells or even, you know, dead cells and debris. And what you really want to uh, isolate and actually do your analysis on are these live cells here in um, uh, open uh, uh, these blue circles, um, those are the cells that you really want to isolate and move forward with. So if you were to start with that sample and not do any uh, sample prep with cell sorting upstream, um, you can do that, but you know it could it will lead to issues, and perhaps 50% of your sample may be useful, and therefore you're you know you're spending more dollars per cell. Uh, whereas if you were to process that and sort that upstream, well, now you're taking advantage of that and your uh, more of your uh, data and bioinformatics and your cells are actually going to be useful. Uh, and then in the end, you're spending a lot less money per cell. So this is a, if you want to take away the practicality of this, that's why we believe this is very important for your experiments. Um, and now I'm just going to go through a few examples of that and so that you can see for yourself and why this is why this is important, especially if you haven't done or not familiar with flow cytometry or cell sorting. Um, so this is an example with Cho cells, uh, Chinese uh, hamster ovary cells. On the left side, you can see uh, these are uh, uh, flow cytometry uh, uh, populations that you can see before sorting. And the red is a lot of dead cells and debris. Uh, on the bottom, we've labeled with propidium iodide and in red are PI positive. So they're PI positive, that means they're dead or dying. And so you, you wouldn't want to start your experiment with this type of population. So when you sort the cells afterwards, we get a much cleaner uh, population. So uh, pretty much only the cells, the live viable cells that you then want to analyze moving forward. So that's, that's really what you really want, want to be working with downstream so that everything else kind of works properly. You're not getting clogged and you're getting very good results uh, in the end. Uh, one of the most popular things that people are studying, and, and that's something that our next uh, presenter, Brian Fritz, will go through as well, uh, is looking at T cells, uh, which is obviously studying immunology, obviously studying uh, you know, within now uh, in the COVID world, uh, that also becomes a, a, a major factor. But it's also if you're uh, doing preclinical research with CAR T cells, obviously that becomes an important uh, uh, a type of cell to study. Uh, so here again, uh, we start in the top, our cells uh, or the sample before being sorted. Uh, this is starting with PBMCs and we're targeting for CD3 positive cells. So you would basically gate for those cells um, on the top right there. And then you would also gate for only the live cells. So it's a multi-parameter gating here. Uh, I want live cells that express CD3 positive cells. And then you would sort that with the wolf cell sorter, and basically you're left with mostly all live cells um, and only the ones expressing CD3 positive cells. So you can see that we get very good viability and purity after the cell. So now you have something that's uh, more specific, and now you can look at um, subsets of those 
uh, of T cells in much, much more detail using 10x genomics. Uh, but now you start with the T cells and you don't worry about any other type of cells. Um, and then this is just showing that these cells are also not just pure and viable, but they're also functional. And what I'm very excited about, and something that Brian will go into a little bit more detail, is what you can do with these cells, with these types of uh, single cell platforms downstream. And one of the new uh, applications is to be able to use uh, multi-parameter analysis with these barcode technologies. Uh, and that's something that Biolegend has been developing uh, with their system and Immudex as well with their system. Um, and again, that's something that Brian will go through, but it's an, an amazing technology that now you can, by, by prepping your cell properly, and in this case, say sorting for CD plus positive cells, you can now go into much more detail and look at you know, dozens of different uh, markers using the, the barcode technology. So what happens when you're looking at very uh, low target population? So let's just say your target population is only 1% of the total uh, population. Well, there's tricks to be able to do that very efficiently. And one of those is to do an, uh, use an enrichment uh, right before doing the final cell sorting. So you could start with a PBMC population from blood. You process that. And in this ex uh, example, we've used Acadian beads. Uh, which are similar to magnetic beads. This is a different uh, uh, way of doing that. Uh, and these Acadian beads can now uh, enrich for CD4 positive cells in this example uh, to then eventually sort specifically for regulatory T cells with the Wolf cell sorter and have very good viability. So by doing that, uh, um, we're able to go after rare populations of cells. Um, and then, so here what I'm showing is basically PE uh, is pre-enrichment, and then you do an enrichment, and then post-sorting, meaning you can now sort for only the viable cells very gently, uh, and these are all, uh, pretty much all the cells are alive. Um, and then we ran that with multiple donors just to kind of show you an example of what you can do, going from like a 1% one, 1 or lower population, target population, and we can consistently get 90% or above um, after sorting uh, um, with respect to purity. So again, now you can take those samples and do uh, any type of 10x genomic application or anything else downstream. Um, and this is a very simple, straightforward um, assay to, to quickly set up and perform. Okay, now there's also gonna be cases where, you know, it's, it's actually quite difficult to obtain a single cell suspensions, and that becomes quite tricky. And where we see that a lot, sometimes it's uh, when people are doing uh, neuro research and they want to take samples from brain tissue or sometimes even from plants uh, where it's also very difficult sometimes to be able to isolate and sort and analyze those cells. Um, so a common way of do addressing that is to then take, um, take those cells and break them apart and, and work with isolated nuclei. And I won't go into the details, but there are uh, definitely numerous, a lot of literature out there showing that you can uh, basically get a lot of insight and very comparable insight by analyzing and looking at nuclei, and they've compared that with uh, actual cells. There's pros and cons, obviously, but it is a very good method um, or alter alternative to um, isolating and working with intact cells. Um, so this is one way, and there's uh, protocols and different ways of being able to isolate those specific for your cell sample. So I would recommend looking at uh, maybe previous uh, publications. There's information on our website and at 10X Genomics website as well for, for those applications. Um, so uh, next, I just wanna show an example of that. So you can take those nuclei, and then uh, in this example, we're uh, looking at uh, nuclei from plants. Uh, we're uh, analyzing tomato uh, nuclei and green bell pepper plants. So this is an experiment that was done uh, actually recently. So when uh, during COVID times, we can, it's a little bit more difficult to get uh, brain tissue, as you could imagine, uh, uh, it's much easier to work around and play with uh, plants at the moment anyways. Uh, as you can see uh, here, we're basically just uh, looking uh, with PI stained uh, nuclei, uh, and the top is the pre-sorted, and the bottom, you can see that the sample is cleaned up. And part of the main application here is to be able to remove a lot of debris and clean it up so that uh, you're, you're actually sorting and then analyzing only the nuclei, not, you know, 
perhaps partially digested uh, nuclei or debris that's left from the cells. And that becomes very important to get richer, cleaner data. Okay, now I'm gonna go briefly on some examples of showcasing kind of the whole workflow and comparing with uh, sorted and unsorted populations and then going into a 10X genomics analysis. Uh, in this experiment, it's a very, very simple experiment. Uh, we just try to uh, uh, look at the, the most uh, the simplest way of analyzing this. So we're basically taking blood from um, human blood and then uh, doing a PBMC analysis and taking 10,000 cells each. And on the top, we're basically going straight into uh, 10X genomics um, and then analyzing that. And then on the bottom, we're basically going into the wolf cell sorter and basically sorting for PBMCs and removing any dead cells and any debris that's there and then going into a 10X genomics experiment. And when we did that, uh, we saw very promising results that uh, when you look at the median genes per cell, uh, the percent reads not associated with a cell, uh, as well as the median uh, UMI counts per cell, it's all improved when you sort the cells um, versus unsorted. So it's not shocking, but I just want to clearly show you guys, you know, the importance of that and how you can get better, better data. And then also when you look at the populations, uh, you also can see that there's more clusters. So it's kind of like a higher definition of your, of your clustering um, that you see. Uh, if you don't sort the cells, we're getting uh, seven clusters. Uh, whereas if you sort the cells, we're now getting nine different clusters from this PM PBMC population. Okay, in this next experiment, we looked at um, stem cells, which are um, the type of cell that's actually very sensitive to sorting and manipulating and working with. Uh, so we want to just kind of showcase and, and, and show that uh, with this experiment, similar type of experiment, uh, except obviously with IPS cells. Uh, and then we're also comparing in this experiment with traditional cell sorters. Uh, here's, uh, um, this is uh, done with a BD Fax Aria at a local uh, core facility here in San Diego. And they set up uh, this experiment with, uh, this is their traditional way of doing it for stem cells, where they try to be very gentle with this technology as well, using 100 micron nozzles and operating at 20 PSI, which is relatively um, lower pressure for, this, for these systems. Uh, and then uh, analyzing that with 10x genomics uh, as well. So when we looked at that, uh, as you can see, um, unsorted versus sorted, when you sort the cells, you're just getting better data, at least when you look at median genes per cell and the UMI counts. Uh, so whether you sort with the wolf or with you, whether you sort with the fax aria, you're getting better quality data. Uh, and as you can see, when you sort with the wolf, uh, the data looks even better. So that's, uh, I just want to maybe cap the experiments here that I'm showcasing here with this paper that uh, we came across that was, uh, I think it's an excellent paper to analyze all the different conditions that are required uh, and, uh, or can affect your downstream analysis. This is done from uh, a group out of the University of Western Australia, Dr. Forrest Lab. And what they did, uh, it's a great paper where they basically looked at different uh, conditions, whether it's looking at 37 degree or dissociation in the cold, comparing samples to nuclei, uh, isolation done at various different conditions. So it's a great paper. I recommend uh, you guys take a look at that. Uh, and basically the conclusion of this, obviously, is that uh, the results that you're getting is very dependent on how you optimize and what you did with the sample. So it's very critical that you guys take that into consideration um, when you're doing your experiment. So that's all I'm going to talk about here. I think uh, this kind of uh, sets it up for Brian to uh, continue uh, uh, his presentation and really go into uh, some of the techniques within uh, 10x genomics. Uh, but I just want to wrap up, obviously, that when you're uh, uh, able to properly prep your sample upstream and you sort the cells right, you go for the right cells, you're now allowing these cells to open up and talk about anything that they want. And with these technologies, now we're able to see them and, and understand them um, a lot better. 
Um, so I'll try to end with a little bit of a lighter note uh, while you guys are sitting at home. Uh, you guys can share these uh, jokes um, wherever you want. Uh, and if you haven't figured out the type of cell there, that's a, a Mr. T cell. Um, and um, I'll stop with the jokes, I guess. Uh, but on a more serious uh, side, I do want to thank uh, and showcase our, our, uh, our team at NanoSelect, a great group of scientists, field application scientists, and internal application scientists, and technical support. And I really want to um, call out Nicole, uh, who um, leads a lot of the 10x genomics applications. Uh, so it, uh, we're not going to go directly into Q&A, but I just want to at least put this up there. Uh, if you have any specific questions after this, uh, um, this webinar, you can email us, uh, info at NanoSelect. Um, but I want to end there, and I want to now introduce Brian Fritz, uh, who will be uh, uh, taking us into uh, this new applications for sample prep and 10x genomics. Uh, Brian, I'll let you uh, take, the, take the floor or the, the web floor. Thank you, Jose. That was a great introduction to the single cell workflows that we'll be talking about a bit more in detail in this part of the presentation. Uh, I'd like to turn now from the background that Jose has delivered to thinking more about the applications that we can uh, pursue with a single cell approach to what we're calling multiomic cytometry. And we'll specifically look at some immune profiling examples as Jose um, alluded to in his part of the presentation, um, and we'll hopefully leave you with some thoughts to Imagine how this can all be implemented in your laboratories as well. So, of course, we're all here because we're interested in studying biology and all of its amazing complexity. And it's useful to remember that biology is uh, an organism specifically composed of diverse tissues and organs. Those tissues and organs are themselves composed of organized and heterogeneous groups of distinct cell types. And those cell types and cell states are largely defined in a number of different ways, but gene expression and, and protein function particularly. And so where we see genes expressed and proteins expressed can tell us a lot about the types of cells that are present in any particular sample. So a comprehensive analysis of all of these different cell types really helps us understand, first and foremost, how organisms are uh, comprised of these different tissues, organs, and cell states, and, and how things can go wrong in disease states that allow us to understand the disease more uh, effectively. We can think of studying biology at a number of different levels, and, and one of the most important, obviously, is studying at the level of the single cell, which are really the, the basic sort of quantum unit of gene expression. All of the gene expression that we're aware of, in, in human terms anyway, usually occurs within a cellular environment, so RNA being transcribed from, from uh, DNA and translated into proteins in a single cell, and then those to analytes giving rise to some states that we can then measure with uh, genomics approaches. But it's important to also remember that these two things, these RNAs and proteins, are not themselves static. They're very dynamic in, in any group of cells. You'll find that RNA and protein half-lives can be very different. The expression patterns of a protein derived from an RNA and vice versa can be different from one another. And there's a lot of really interesting regulatory mechanisms in biology that, that regulate the expression of these molecules in single cells. And so having as many different uh, analytes as possible from a single cell is a really interesting way of thinking about how to understand biology more deeply. So I'll give you some examples of that throughout this presentation today. And we'll focus, again, really intently on the immune system, which has a lot of really interesting tools developed for it a lot of uh, interesting publications to reflect on how single cells and immune states can be defined. Um, we'll be able to think uh, in about some of these applications today. We'll not be able to get to all of them, but this is an example of many different multiomic types of measurements that we can make from a single cell. At the same time, can include measurements of RNA and proteins, as we've already said. We'll look specifically at layering in some additional targeted gene expression measurements of T and B cell receptor genes as well as the antigens to which those T and B cell receptors are specific. Uh, we can also think about doing some genetic engineering and introducing CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNAs that are compatible with capture from the uh, 10X genomic single cell system. Um, in the future, we won't cover this today, but we can also think about imagining um, some applications where we're looking at chromatin states as well as gene expression at the same time. You saw some of this in Jose's presentation, but we'll briefly go through just the quick highlights of how the 10X genomic single cell immune profiling systems work. We're looking here at 
the many different parts of this process that 10 Genomics provides, and that's a, a system, an instrument for performing a microfluidic separation of single cells in a solution. We sell the consumables and other reagents required to uh, partition single cells and to perform some types of genomic operations upon them. And then we, we also support and sell, uh, provide rather the software required to take sequencing information and turn it into a biologically interesting data set. Within the heart of that instrument, the uh, workflow is schematically organized here. You can see our uh, eight-channel chip on the lower left-hand side. Within that chip, the microfluidic channels collect cells in an aqueous solution, also containing some of the enzymatic reagents required for reverse transcription, which will happen in just a, uh, another step forward in this particular schematic. And those cells and enzymes colliding in solution with a uh, barcoded primer library, which is, a, uh, you'll see this in another couple of slides, that's physically uh, partitioned into single uh, single uh, cells and partitions with a gel bead called a GEM technology. And what this allows us to do is to introduce cells at limiting dilution into that microfluidic channel and capture them so there's a single cell per oil and water uh, emulsion or partition within uh, a larger oil uh, and water separation. Those partitions then, within those partitions, the gel bead dissolves. The cells are uh, also lysed and so we can start to capture the RNA at a single cell level with the oligonucleotides that are brought to the partition by the gem itself. That allows us to capture up to 80,000 cells per plate, per microfluidic chip, and we can do up to eight samples in parallel through each of the eight channels on the chip. We're expecting that we capture about two thirds of what we put in, uh, for, as long as the cells and suspension are at the right limiting dilution going into the system. And uh, then again, at the outset, we can think about designing experiments that are compatible with whole transcriptome, targeted gene expression, and as we'll see, a, a number of additional analytes as well. You definitely saw this slide from Jose earlier, but suffice to say, again, once we start with cells or nuclei, as Jose pointed out, um, in those the input material for a gem generation process within the instrument, we perform a barcoding of cDNA at a single cell level within each of those gel beads and emulsions, and then break those gems open and perform the rest of the sequencing library prep uh, on the bench in a bulk type of approach, which then allows us to put those on in a, a sequencing instrument, followed by data processing and uh, visualization. So I mentioned that each of those partitions that we capture single cell in has a gel bead. Those gel beads are coated with oligonucleotide, and the schematic form of those gel bead oligonucleotides is shown uh, in one form here. So we can think about combining um, the capture of polyadenylated messenger RNAs with an oligo-DT uh, stretch shown here on the topmost oligonucleotide in the gem. Each of the gel bead oligos also has a unique molecular identifier, and it's like its name suggests, this is a unique uh, oligonucleotide sequence that we use to count the number of transcripts that we see in every single cell and then assign those transcripts back to a single cell of origin using the 10x barcode sequence, which is adjacent to the UMI. So these two oligonucleotide sequences are critically important parts of the gel bead oligonucleotide technology. The gel bead oligonucleotide, every single 10x barcode is the same, so that all of the UMIs that associate with that cell are then collapsed bioinformatically back to the cell of origin with that 10x barcode sequence. You'll notice also that there's two additional capture sequences on this gel bead oligonucleotide, and this is from our, our three prime gene expression platform. In this way, we can design um, some very specific oligonucleotide sequences that we can capture with these non polyadenylated sequence elements. And so we have a reverse complement structure on oligonucleotide that we can uh, conjugate to another biomolecule, like an antibody reagent. We can capture that reagent within the same single cell, uh, sorry, same single partition as the single cells that we're analyzing. And shown here is just a representative example of some of the types of reagents that we have been able to use within our system that are brought to us by our commercial partners at BioEdge and Imidex and Millipore Sigma, respectively. We're able to think about employing experimental designs with antibodies that have been conjugated with oligonucleotide barcodes. And we'll get into some of the experimental use cases of these in the next couple of slides after the introduction here. We've also been able to develop the uh, 
specificity testing using dextrin reagents from Imidex. <clears throat> These are peptide MHC molecules that have, again, an oligonucleotide conjugated to them so that we can count the number of dextrin reagents that are inside of partition of a single cell. And we can also think about introducing guide RNAs that have an oligonucleotide barcode sequence that can affect a genetic modification to single cells, and then we can count the number of single cells that have any one of a number of highly multiplexed guide RNA molecules. So really the, the first publication in this entire space uh, is shown here. There's actually two that were uh, within 2017, um, almost back to back in terms of publication. Um, the first of these was termed the SiteSeq paper, which was a term given to this type of process by the authors of that uh, publication. Really what they're describing here though is the use of a 10x genomic system to combine single cells with um, antibody reagents that had canonically been used for flow cytometry. The authors uh, acquired the same antibody specificities instead of attaching a fluorophore to them, attached an oligonucleotide barcode sequence, which was amenable to analysis in the 10x genomic single cell system. So in this way, we're able to combine the best of both worlds in terms of cytometric analysis and next generation sequencing. So the first use case described for this type of multiomic single cell approach is shown here. And on the left-hand side, we're seeing a flow cytometric separation of T cells into two-dimensional space using markers for CD4 and CD8 respectively. And we can see the distribution of T cells that have high or low CD4 and CD8 expression. We see the same relative pattern of T cells separating in two dimensions using the multiomic uh, cytometric approach, which is um, again using CD4 and CD8 markers to separate T cells in a two dimensional space. But the real power of this type of multiomic gene expression and protein epitope mapping experiment is shown here in this experimental view of the same uh, set of cells. And on the left hand side, we're seeing a TC or two dimensional image that's separating the PBMCs as the starting material for this experiment into their component cell states based on mRNA-based gene expression measurements. We'll see T cells separating from B cells, NK cells, monocytes, et cetera. And we're taking these single cell colors for each of the uh, gene expression states and mapping them onto the two-dimensional profile of the uh, antibody-based measurements. So we have CD4 and CD8 separating T cells in two-dimensional space again. And we can see that the intermediate and low expressing cells in this particular example map to known gene expression states that are defined by the mRNA-based gene expression measurement. So really with this approach, what we're able to do is take the best possible use cases of cytometric analysis and next generation sequencing and put them together to more finely resolve the types of cells that are present in any particular heterogeneous system by looking at all the different types of markers that can help us resolve a single cell one from the other. So we'll like to extend this concept a little bit further and look at a few different other analytes that we can measure in single cells simultaneously. And with this example, we'll start to look a bit more closely at the, the T cell receptors here as shown in yellow on this particular slide. There's a really nice publication again from New York Genome Center here um, is an example of this that came out a couple of years ago. In, in the same 10X genome single cell system, they developed a means for analyzing gene expression at the mRNA level as well as paired full-length T cell receptor alpha and beta and T cell receptor gamma and delta genes. And they looked at 49 cell surface epitopes for those barcoded antibody reagents at the same time, as well as measuring the presence or absence of a large number of multiplex crispr cap single guide RNAs that were introduced into the same system that had an oligonucleotide barcode sequence that was compatible with capture on the 10X genomics uh, platform. So in this particular publication, the authors demonstrated the multiomic detection of a very large number of different uh, bioanalytes simultaneously, all from single cells, and were able to assess whether they could have achieved the genetic engineering of a number of different cell states all in the same heterogeneous sample. We can take this kind of concept and extend it a little bit further, and this is work that was done uh, here at 10X Genomics in the R&D group. And in this experiment, which we'll go through for the next couple of slides of the presentation, we're again thinking about sorting T cells using flow cytometric analysis and then incubating those T cells uh, with uh, dextromer reagents in this particular case so that we can assess antigen specificity of those T cells as well as simultaneously the gene expression 
uh, measurements of those T cells, we can assign a cell state by mRNA and cell surface epitope mapping. Along the way, we had to develop a lot of uh, uh, experience with these types of reagents and, and uh, in combination with our counterparts at some of our partner organizations like BioLegend, did a lot of work to QC these types of reagents and make sure that they were working as we expected that they would. And so we'll walk through some of those QC, QC steps first before we get into the heart of the application itself. Shown here is just one example of that. If we take the same antibody specificity, and this is obviously shown schematically in this case, on the one hand, we'd have a flow cytometry analysis using a fluorophore conjugated antibody. And on the other hand, we'd have an oligonucleotide conjugated antibody to enable us to count the same cell surface epitope in a next generation sequencing uh, experiment. And we can use a secondary antibody to verify the presence of that uh, in, in, in biology in terms of total seq reagent, which has the oligonucleotide barcode associated with the antibody. So when we do this in practice, the results look rather like this. So on the, um, the top line, we're looking at CD14, bottom line is CD15. And we're here comparing the results of analysis of these two cell surface markers with flow cytometry, as in the far left-hand part of the plot, and with the total seq reagents, which use next-generation sequencing as a detector and as an output. And you can see if you have the right amounts of antibodies titrated for both of these two detectors, you can get highly concordant results. And you can look at the results in terms of the total UMIs as well as the amount of uh, antibody staining by uh, fluorescent cytometry. If on the other hand, you have an under titrated amount of antibody, as in this particular case for CD15 in an example, you start to lose some of the signal that was otherwise present. And when we titrate the antibodies correctly, uh, obviously, this isn't the final product that Biologen would be selling, but when, it's, when you do this kind of work, you can more finely de determine the amount of reagent to use in any one of these particular experiments. So here's another example of that shown in a bit more detail, taking again, in this case, CD3, and titrating across a range of concentration, both with feature barcoding or the oligonucleotide tagging on the top line, and the flow cytometric analysis on the bottom line. So we can again find that range of concentration, which you'll note might be different between these two types of experimental outputs, where the uh, antibody reagents pr produce a concordant result. And finally, just another way of thinking about how to visualize this data. On the left-hand side here, we're showing antibodies in uh, approaching space and concentration. And we show on the right-hand side a correlation with those concentrations with the amount of staining observed in the sequencing data. So when you have a really high concentration antibody, uh, higher than actually necessary, you can start to get uh, background staining, which of course we want to avoid. So it's best to be able to think about designing these experiments with the types of reagents that are available from a commercial partner, such as BioLegend in this case, who've done the work to make sure that the antibodies you're using are at the right concentration before you use them. Um, if you're using something that's uh, novel to you and it's just developed from a hybridoma, for example, then these are the kinds of experimental QC steps you might want to consider before you're embarking on this type of experiment. Okay, but when you have all these reagents in place, you have the dextromers conjugated with oligonucleotide and a fluorophore that allows them also to be sorted. You have a combination of fluorescently labeled antibodies as well as oligonucleotide tag feature barcode enabled antibody reagents. You can think about adding these all to cells according to a particular experimental design. In this case, we loaded the dextromers first, waited 10 minutes, added the antibody reagents, and then washed a number of times before we started to sort them for a combination of CDA positive as well as dextromer positive T cells. And so the gating strategy is shown on the lower right hand side. And from PBMCs, the starting material, we went through a series of different steps, including a dead cell removal, as Jose mentioned in his presentation. Um, some of the resources for this are shown on the upper right-hand side, but most of this is captured in, in some uh, demonstrated protocols that we have available on the 10X Genomics website. And at the end of the day, we start off with a number of gems, a number of single cells. We reduce that down to a really highly selected number of CDA positive and dextromer positive T cells. So as Jose pointed out, uh, uh, flow cytometry in this case is absolutely critical to the efficient success of this type of experiment. We're looking for really, really rare dextromer positive and antigen specific T cells in a CDA positive population specifically. 
And so if we started from just bulk PBMCs, we'd spend an incredible amount of money just sorting PBMCs before we found these little needles in the haystack. So flow cytometry ends up being a critical uh, part of this entire workflow. That's just shown here in, in, a, in a broad view. Again, we're taking single cells and a bunch of different reagents, performing a flow cytometric analysis prior to putting those sorted cells into the 10X genomics instrument, after which we can capture simultaneously from the same single cells a gene expression, mRNA-based signature, as well as a protein cell surface epitope mapping signature, those feature barcode-enabled uh, antibody reagents, and again, the uh, T cell receptor gene sequences specifically, as well as the antigen specificity of those same T cells, all from the same single cell. And in practice, what that looks like is shown here. So when we uh, have, in this particular example, used a CMV seropositive donor and sorted out PBMCs from that particular donor, we're able to sort cells according to gene expression measurements at the mRNA level. And we're also able to define uh, uh, cell sorting states uh, using the cell surface markers uh, based on the total seq antibody panel that we had available at the time. And in those same single cells, we're able to resolve rather uh, nicely some very specific T cell populations that are phenotypically distinct in some cases, yet have the same um, antigen specificity. So shown on the right-hand side, for example, we have two uh, separate groups of CMV positive T cells, both specific for HLA or, or HLB uh, 0702 and a very specific CMV peptide. And separately, we have another entire clonally expanded set of TCR clonotypes that are specific for HLA-0101 and another CMV-specific peptide. So within the same experimental design, we're able to resolve the T-cell receptor gene sequence, the TCR specificity for antigen in presence of a MHC molecule, as well as the cell surface phenotype, the immunophenotype of that same T-cell. When we scale this up, we've done this a couple different times at 10X Genomics, we can think about inputting millions of uh, input CDA-positive T cells. We can highly multiplex the number of different antigens that we test for specificity for. In this particular case, we have uh, 50 total dextromer molecules, although eight of those are negative controls. We ultimately derived about 200,000 single cells after sorting, and it took us about a week of time um, for the rest of the single cell analysis to get that selected down to a group of uh, about 62,000 antigen binding cells that we were comfortable calling antigen binding, which results and collapsed into about 11,600 separate TCR clonal uh, specificities for antigen. And shown in the final bottom right portion of this is what happens when you add this in single experimental data set from a single cell genomics experiment um, to the existing database of uh, TCR antigen specificity interactions. So that ends up uh, leading us with 43 out of 44 of the antigens that we tested, having uh, defined T cell receptor antigen specificity, for which 25 of those antigens had never previously had a TCR specificity, uh, specificity described in a database before. So those were novel entries into the VEJ database that we're pretty excited about following up in more detail at some point in the future. So finally, in summary, just want to review where we've come from throughout the presentation, had a bit of a review on the 10 genomics technology, and before that with Jose, a, a review on, on how to think about designing experiments that incorporate flow cytometry into single cell genomic separations and workflows. Hopefully giving you some insight into how to use the combination of flow cytometry with multi-omic cytometry to design the right best experiment, to think about how to identify those rare cells and, and uh, to define heterogeneity and we can also think, as, as Jose pointed out, about applications in stem cell research, not just in immunology. And hopefully give you some food for thought about how to think about a holistic workflow from sample acquisition all the way through to uh, bioinformatic analysis and this type of workflow. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the rest of the organization who's not standing with me here at this presentation, but at 10X Genomics, the, the broad group of people in um, R&D, sales, marketing, other roles that helped to provide everything that we had a chance to talk about today. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. We'll be happy to take some questions. And thank you, Jose and Brian, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar.
If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look at our first incoming questions because our audience has already sent us several. <clears throat> our first question is for Brian. Did you notice a discrepancy between RNA and protein detections for any of the genes? Yeah, thanks for that question. We do see that pretty commonly in our customers as well. It's a very um, common um, molecular genomic phenotype of looking at RNA and protein simultaneously in single cells. And I think we have biology to thank for this, and it's very cell type dependent, obviously. So where RNAs are expressed, Sometimes proteins are, are not terribly abundant, and where proteins can be stably expressed, RNAs can be uh, rapidly uh, degraded. So um, really what this enables us to do is learn more about the regulatory mechanisms that guide gene expression, both at the RNA and protein level. Uh, and so we think that integrating these kinds of observations into our worldview of the, the um, multi-omic um, states of single cells was really informative as we learn more about the data and, and we see this applied to more and more cells and, and organisms. Thank you so much, Brian. And our next question is for you, Jose. Can epithelial cells be sorted out, selected for, enriched for from a mixed cell population? And, and actually, this is a two-part question. What are the minimum input requirements? For example, can disassociated cells from core needle biopsies be recovered with the wolf system? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, it is a little bit loaded, and it obviously depends always on uh, the sample that you start with. Uh, but, you know, uh, what you really minimally need is to be able to have single cell suspension. Uh, sometimes there's uh, reagents to allow you to do that before putting that into uh, 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 the wolf cell sorter, uh, and in the end, you know what you want to be able to have is uh, a minimal no number of target cells that you're going after. Uh, and in our hands, I mean, it really varies, but we've been able to get away with uh, in the very kind of low end, in the 10 to 20,000 cell range of, se of target cells that you sort out. Uh, and sometimes you want to sort a little bit more just so that you you have enough uh, in case you have lost during pipetting and things like that. Um, I hope that answered that question. Uh, it was a little bit multi-part. Thank you so much, Jose. And, and actually, continuing the discussion about sorting, how long would it take to sort about 10,000 cells with a wolf sorter? Or a different way we asked, how many cells could you process in, like, let's say, an hour? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it depends on the concentration. We give a guidance of the uh, concentration of cells that one can start with. Uh, and in about 40 minutes, uh, you can process about a milliliter of sample. Um, and so, you know, from, from start to finish, you know, if you're doing a whole a mil sample, it could be about, you know, about an hour or so from setup. Uh, and the concentrations there, uh, again, range from 100,000 cells per mil to a million cells per mil. Um, and, and that just depends on the, uh, uh, the, the purity that you want to get at the end. On the lower concentration of cells, you, you start to get much higher purity. Um, and it just depends on and, uh, how you optimize your particular experiment. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. We always love this live participation. Brian, how many genes would be detected using the 10x single cell sequencing? Yep, uh, good question. Pretty common one as well. And, and again, this is a cell type and sample type dependent answer. It's not all, <clears throat> not all cells express the same amounts of uh, mRNA, but typically we think of being able to capture many thousands of genes per cell from any sample. And um, you know, we see a very large number of, of genes in, in some sample types that express a large number of RNAs and some more primary cell types that are a bit more transcriptionally quiescent. We see many fewer, but it's, it's generally in the range of thousands. Thank you very much. And Jose, how about the cells, how many would you need to sort on the WOOF for a 10X genomics experiment? 
Yeah, like I said, I think the um, uh, a little bit similar to the pre prior question, uh, I would say the uh, the minimal uh, number of cells that we've gotten away with, I believe, is in the range of uh, 10,000 to 20,000 cells. Uh, but I think uh, you know, you would I would go by some of the recommended um, you know, requirements from the from 10x genomics, uh, which they sometimes you know would recommend more just because you, you might lose some cells. Um, but I think uh, because of our uh, the way our platform operates, uh, we were, we're able to retain a lot of the viable cells and not lose much cells. We're able to get away with uh, a little bit less. Thank you so much. And Brian, have you have either of you looked at the sample processing step using tissue as a starting sample? We have, yeah. So there are a number of protocols. Um, some of them are collected on the Tenex Genomics website under our support uh, .tenexgenomics.com resource pages, depending on which um, product you're using. Um, and many others are done by our customers. So in the publication record, where we have over a thousand publications now, um, I'd say a, a large majority of those are done with um, tissue, many different types of tissue. Sometimes you get a, a better result with nuclei, as, as Jose mentioned in his part of the talk. Um, just depends on the ease with which you can dissociate a tissue into viable, healthy, uh, intact single cells. Um, and protocols.io uh, .io can be another resource that uh, some of the human cell atlas and other customer types have been posting resources and protocols to. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. Thank you so much. And Brian, sticking with you, how many parameters um, can I analyze in the 10x multiomics cytometry workflow? Mm -hmm. Another good question. So in addition to all of the genes that you can detect, which we already discussed in another prior answer, um, in thinking about parameterization and more as a, a cytometric term, um, the number of cell surface epitopes that we have seen assessed, and this isn't published yet, but we definitely have people doing this in practice out there in, in different customer laboratories. It's well into the hundreds, so um, data sets as large as 300 or more are not inconceivable. I think the choice of how many of those parameters to uh, assess simultaneously is obviously experimental design and sample dependent. So um, what I think you can appreciate, though, is that the number of parameters you can look at is going to be a many-fold higher than uh, what you would typically see with uh, uh, a cytometric analysis using flow or mass cytometry techniques. Thank you so much, Brian. And we have time for a few more questions. I want to remind the audience that any questions not answered today will be answered via email. Um, Brian, actually one more for you. Did you have, do you have any COVID-19 related data generating using the 10X genomics technology that you can share? Uh, yes, we do. We have a COVID resource page on our website, um, which you can find uh, through the product areas and research areas for immunology. Um, we don't have any publications from 10 Genomics. We do not have a BSL 2 plus or 3 facility, so we don't handle those kinds of samples ourselves. But we do have uh, something like 15 publications now um, from customers um, and, and probably three or four times that many preprints. So there's plenty of data out there to choose from. Um, if you're not finding exactly what you're looking for on our resource page or in publications, um, you could uh, leave us a note at support at 10 genomicscom and we can help to maybe find something else for you. Thank you so much, Brian. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation today and clearly important research. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our audience before we end today? Yeah, I'd like, you, Jose, yeah, if you'd like. Yeah, I'd like to say thanks, everybody, for uh, coming and joining us uh, today. It's uh, Great to have a, a very diverse uh, type of audience here, and uh, our team is readily available to take additional calls uh, separately, or you know, have one-on-one -on -one, uh, video chats to kind of work through specific uh, uh, workflow solutions that you guys may have. And same for myself. Thanks okay. again for your participation. The devil is always in the details here, and we have a lot of practice in our customers as well, and trying to turn these applications into uh, you know, publication-ready types of, of uh, approaches. So 
uh, we'll get to the questions that we didn't get to offline, and we'll be looking forward to chatting more with you all uh, through email or other means in the near future to answer additional questions that you have. Thank you again, Jose Marachis, Brian Fritz, and both of you for your time today and for your important research. I also want to thank LabRoot and our sponsors, NanoSelect Biomedical and 10X Genomics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And questions we didn't have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe, take care, bye-bye, have a great day.